Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. This is the Sabbath Bible study. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank God for everyone being out. And yes, we are on both. So we do have some platforms that we share with everyone that we're using. So as a result, we want to make sure that we keep these things consistent. And definitely want to uh, go from here. So we're going to go ahead with a word of prayer. I'll be Yahweh. In the name of Yeshua Messiah, I love you. We're sorry. We ask you to forgive us and we say thank you. We ask right now that you would heal us on every level layer within ourselves and that everything in which you do on tonight is because it is your will only and not ours. Every issue we have that you will speak to and heal it energetically, spiritually, mentally, even on levels which we have no idea even exist. That as you do that, Father, I'll be always that you lead and guide us into the steps and into the resources to make you reveal, Father. And being said, that we'll be filled with your spirit, led by your spirit, and even with the truth of the matters in which you're healing so that we can get some clarity. We ask for Father God, that in the name of Yeshua Messiah, that you, Abi Yahweh, will meet us and minister to us all, myself included. And this Bible study be what you say for it to be. In the name of Yeshua Messiah, I mean. I want to just come If you are new with us and you haven't used that, it's fine. You can let us know. I do want to say to everyone who's been with us, and when I say you've been with us for a while, around about over a year, at least six months and over, you all know the drill far as the links that we've sent out, because if one does not work, please go to the next one. And I'm asking everyone to please take up, and this is this is mainly for the people that's been with us for six months and, and plus. To be responsible, please test out the links. We know things happen. We know things do come up, and as a result, we have more than one platform to stream on, so that way people won't get lost. Now, the Facebook uh, situation earlier, they put a link in there for YouTube, so it can be shown on YouTube. And uh, well, the link for YouTube can be streamed on the Facebook page. Also, uh, the YouTube page captures the recordings of our Bible study. So I'm just laying down some foundation and, and no one is in trouble. And this is not a rebuke, nothing like that. This is just getting some clarification out there. And we ask everyone to be respectful and courteous when they do give feedback, because myself and those who assist me, we are very understanding people. So we're never people that you have to get smart mouth with or make a nasty comment or be just flat out just rude at the least. <clears throat> or like some people like to do, they like to talk to you where they cussing you out without actually using cuss words. There's no need for that. So I'm just making it clear that we're gonna. This is all part of. This is all part of the study. This is all part of just understanding how ourselves. And also, this is me me understanding of those who come out to the study, so that way we have an environment where everyone can learn. Because one thing we're not going to do is condone inappropriate behavior. Anybody who want to pull their they draws now, figuratively or literally, and show each butt to the crack of their behind, that's unacceptable. I know that sounds kind of blunt, but sometimes you have to be that definitive because some people don't think you meant them per se. And I'm not talking about anybody in particular. No, not at all. I am talking about certain behavior. So your behaviors can be equivalent to someone show, showing where to sign, if you will. And then definitely reconsider how you talk to the next person. So we're going to go ahead. We're going to get to the scriptures. Now, you may have noted it up, and this is going to be called Believe in the Hype. And the reason it's called that is because too often people are taught the word, in particular, uh, quite often, and where it actually pertains to the heights and what God gonna what God gonna do for you 
by way of how much money or how many things you can do for the church. Yes, the church is considered the body of Christ, but it's not the church building you go to. It is the church as a whole, as according to the scriptures. Everyone who was a believer and worshiper of Jesus Christ or Yeshua Messiah, as we call, you know, refer to him as Hebrew name. We would use both. But as we refer to him, we're talking about the one true and risen king, <laughs> Yeshua Messiah, there's only one. And with that being said, sometimes we're taught in places like that. <laughs> far as some church environments it might be other you know environments like a televangelist or an internet based no pun intended ministry like ours they may teach a doctrine that says that the the do for god or do for the body of christ is doing for them as that particular ministry they are one of many and we don't have the franchise on god we don't he ain't passed out no franchise contracts for anyone uh, like you would do with the Golden Arches or Birdie King or somewhere else that does a franchise model where you actually license from the organization and the organization has you pay them a fee uh, monthly or every three months, however the deal is, and you give them a cut. No, we don't We don't have that going on here, and, and that is not uh, the way they go about things. But people do present themselves as far as those who teach and preach the word of God that way may it be on purpose or may it be by conditioning may it be just been what they taught and as a result people get these beliefs and this is going to be the key word beliefs that say that you must do for the church and doing for the church the same doing for god that's not the truth no that is not the truth matter of fact the church is supposed to be doing god's work the church is supposed to be out in the community and helping those. Yes, a church can have an actual building and they can have a place where they teach the word of God. But it's to do that so that you can have people get taught the word of God so they can live it out and do what? Be led by God on how to fulfill the purpose for their life. Everyone in this universe that's on planet Earth has a supernatural gift in them. And God wants to take that supernatural gift and make use of it according to his will. And God is not a person that's going to have you do something for him. You don't get the benefits of it. You may not be rich today, but you will see fruits of your labor as you begin to obey him. God told you that you're going to be a millionaire, for example. You may not be a million dollar millionaire today when you have at least a million dollars in your possession. But you will see the momentum of things start to build towards that as you follow God. Since God is the one telling he's going to do that for you. Since Yahweh, to be exact, is saying he's going to do that. And so you should be able to have some fruits of your labor. It's not going to be one day you go from being in poverty, broke, and then in late in the midnight hour, God turning around literally, and you are now the next day a millionaire. I'm not saying that cannot happen. It, that could happen. But based on what we've seen in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, God promises somebody something, and they go through progressive steps. And through those progressive steps God gives them, you begin to see their momentum build. Momentum of what? of them doing the right thing, of God's will be a filled in their life. So you may not be a millionaire today, but somewhere in there, you're going hit to the, hit the 100,000 mark some kind of way, $300,000 mark, the $700,000 mark, and then millionaire status. You should have some fruits of what? Your labor. When you see seeds planted in the ground, the tree does not sprout up the next day. You have a stem. You have sprouts. Then you start to have a small tree and a small tree has small fruit. But as that tree begins to grow and go through the cycles of, of the planting seeds and harvest season, the tree becomes bigger and bigger. Agriculture is probably one of the greatest examples we could use about growth and development. Human nature and human beings work the same way. We have what they call exponential growth. That means we grow in increments in spurts. It's a mixture of both. And maybe I should show that next time in the Bible study what and what an exponential function is so that everybody can see what exactly what I'm talking about. And, and we have I have no problem doing that. We might get into that. And I just want to say right now, I'm not a Hebrew Israelite. I'm not the nation of Islam. I'm a believer in Yeshua Messiah. That's the Hebrew name of Jesus Christ. And, I, and, and therefore his father, Abba, Yahweh, God, the father, and then the spirit of truth, which is the uh, 
we call him the Holy Spirit. I do believe there's one God and this Bible study supports that. And one God has three different manifestations that each minister to man as a whole. Mm -hmm. Man is spirit, soul, and body. Man has three manifestations in him. And God has provisions to where he ministers to all three provisions within man. Because man was made in what? In the image of God. And that was in Genesis itself. We're going to go to scripture now, but that's, we just had to lay a foundation. Now, in the book of Genesis, we're going to talk about beliefs. I'm going to start with or Moshe in the Hebrew. And Moses, this is the prior where Moses is following God and Moses told was told not me, correction, not Moses. Excuse me. We're not going to start with him. He is in Genesis too, but we're going to start with before there ever was a Moses. We're going to start with Abraham. We're going to start with Abraham when he was just Abram or, or Abram. We're going to start with Abram, father Abraham. We know him as if you ever did that song, of father Abraham had many sons yet. All right, we're going to start, not Moses, and I do not want to confuse people. We're going to start with Abram or Father Abraham. His name was changed to Abraham by God's covenant with him. I want to make that very clear. He was not Abraham at first. He became Abram. So the story of Abram, of Abram or even Abraham is an interesting story because of the fact it shows how God can change your name and can change who you are by following him. We're going to talk about beliefs and we, we talk about believing, not believing in the hype. <laughs> but there was no hype with this. People teach this hype hyped up. Well, let's let's just go to scripture. Let the scripture speak for itself. Now, this is when Abram was promised son, which is Isaac, because him and Sarah could not have a child. But understand something. Abram was put in a position where he was voluntold, when you get volunteering told, or as someone said, tell asking, when you've been told and asked at the same time, when someone tell you something in an asking way, or basically it's just known as a threat <laughs> by his wife, whose name was Sarai, who uh, later on became Sarah. She wanted a child. She told him to basically um, get it in with the Egyptian concubine named Hagar. So he got her pregnant and they, and they had Ishmael. Ishmael and Ishmael was the firstborn, but Ishmael was not the promise that Yahweh gave Abram. This is this happens sometimes with us when we get impatient and we start to believe the pressure or believe the hype, if you will, and not trusting God. But let's talk about what happens when you actually trust God, even when you mess up. Because God still let him know that was not the, the plan. And God still had it where if you want the promise, you're going to have to obey me. And that's God himself. If you want what he has to offer, there's a reason why he asks us to do things a certain way. God gives it to us. Guess what no man can do? Take it away. When you do stuff the way God say do it, he sets you up when you can't take it away. So let's look at this description. In chapter 15 of Genesis, in verse 1, it says this here. After these things, reading from the Amplified, from the left side of the screen. After these things, the word of the Lord, or Yahweh, came in the vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward for obedience shall be great. Whoa, wait a minute. You get to be rewarded for obedience? Now, this is the translated or transliterated version of the Hebrew Amplified Bible. And that's why I use it, because it's easy to read. Now, the King James has said that fear not, uh, fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and and thy exceeding great reward. God said, I'm your reward is what he's saying. I am thy shield and your reward. But the reward comes from where? Obedience. God does not reward you for doing what you want to do. Many people believe that as long as I repent of my sins, I can do what I want to get blessed. No, obedience means you follow the instructions. And you follow them according to what God gave you exactly to do. And our job is to do our, our very best. Because here's the thing about it. When we do anything, we can improve on the skill. 
It becomes second nature. So imagine if you did your very best every time to obey God, what would happen? Your ability to obey and submit to God would improve greatly. If my best was always than I did, that means my best would improve. It would not become better. And I have a, I have a stick. I'm a stickler for the word better. And it's, an, and it's for good reason. People use the word better. B-E-T-T-E-R. B as in Bill. E as in Edward. T as in Tom. T as in um, Terrell. E as in Edward. R as in Robert. People use that word abusively in the English language in this day and age. People tell you, I'm, I'm going I'm to do I'm Okay, I, I'll do better next time. And next time you just do one more of the thing you would do. Even more clear example, give somebody 10 things to do in, in the workplace. A boss can give someone 10 things. Yeah. One, zero, 10, T-E-N. Yeah. T as in Terrence, E as in uh, uh, as Edward, N as in Nancy, 10. And they do two out of the 10. And the boss say, hey, look, you need to you need to do all 10. This ain't no just you just do what you want to do. That's all, right, all right, boss, man, I, 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 I do better next time. So next time they do what? Three out of the 10. Now, is three out of the 10 better than two. Yeah. But is that really doing your best? No, your best might have been six out of 10. And because you're going to do your best every time, you end up doing 10 out of 10 the next time because it was a learning curve. So let's be be weary of that. As I get older, when people say, I'm going to do better, I start asking people, do better at what exactly? What you going to do better at? And how? <laughs> and it's not, folks, understand this. The, we live in the age now of the me, myself, and I movement. I know that was a, a big hit by Tony, Tony, Tony. But it, the song very much was was the truth. Me, myself, and I. That's all we think about. Me, myself, and I. Because it's my life, my life in the sunshine. I know that's a Roy Ayer song, but it was a beautiful song. Then redid by Mary J. Blood. The song makes it very clear. Why don't you look in my life, see what I see. My life, my life in the sunshine. Because that's all people want to do. They want to be sunshine in their life and think about one person, them. And that's it. Because I got me, myself, and I. So because of that, that's that's you know three is a crowd, man. I can't I can't do nothing else. But I want you to look at obedience, the ability to obey. All right, let's go forward in this. I want to make it clear. And the King James is the most accurate translation. He says, God says, I am thy shield and seeding great reward. So God is saying he is <laughs> Abraham's reward. Let's look at further what's going to happen with that. Verse 2, back over in Amplified, it says, And Abram said, when he said Yahweh, What reward will you give me since I am leaving this world childless? And, and he who will be the owner and heir of my house is the servant Eleazar from Damascus. Verse three, Abraham continues, you have given no child to me. One, a servant born in my house is the heir. Because in ancient times, you need to have a man. Because a man had the ability to do what? He can procreate. Yes. And he can delegate. It was for the man, the family, not the woman. Now, we live in day and age now with those positions. and those, um, People talking about things being gender specific and the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, the, the movement that goes on about what they call the beta male movement, where the male is supposed to be subservient, not just to a woman, but he is subservient to all things. But he's a pushover, a chump, a mark, a skip, scal scallywag. This is the perception of the media. This is not God's perception. And God did not say nothing about a man had to be the head over the woman in terms of the job market. He said when it comes to the relationship of man and woman, being married and when it comes to the house the man is the head he is the one i look at and hold accountable never said a woman could not go and be an engineer she could not own a business matter of fact if you read proverbs 31 you will see very clearly that the woman was very industrious as the man was see what the man did was he went out and made the connections and he met and made decisions to actually 
We have the family have the ability to have money and to be and to be successful, to have what's called success in where they lived at. He he delegated business. The woman delegated the business of the house. She oversaw all the decisions to be made. So in other words, if we put it in today's language, it would have been the woman will oversee all the major repairs to the house. She would set up all the all the contracts for the contractor. She would overlook the stuff. She would look at the budget that had to be done. And she would actually look, look at what needed to be delegated, needed to be bought, what needed to be replaced. She would do the research. She would even have an a, a ability where she would cultivate her own income to make sure, certain that the house and those who dwelled in the house was there to man secure the money to make sure that everyone had inheritance, made sure if anything happened to him, there was money set aside and there was a uh, like a life insurance policy because life insurance policy is a way to create an they call it an instant estate. So then be inherited to the wife, to the family, be covered. He would go out and make deals. He would actually take the sons with him and train them how to do business. I remember back in the day, my grandfather did that. If he went somewhere, he'd take me with him because he wanted me to see how he did what? Business. And I learned a lot from watching him do business. When I got old and got grown, I was able to do things second nature because I saw a man delegate new business. And guess what that did? He couldn't take me everywhere. So he could only go certain places when I was around. That kept him out of trouble. That practice did not come just from the so-called um, old school from the practice done in antiquity. Black folks did it. White folks did it. Latino people did it. Every, every culture did it back in the day. We live in an age now where you may not have a father in the home, so the mother has to be the one that's the head and has to work. But we're not talking about someone being sexist. We're talking about responsibility. Because the man was held accountable by who? God himself. And even by the law in that day and age. If things in your house became an issue in the streets, the elders of the community, meaning the politicians and the rulers, would come have a talk with who? The husband. The whole husband accountable. This is your house. So either you take control of your house, we're going to take uh, an issue with you. It was the, was the decision making in that day and time. So I'm just giving it very clear as to why he's doing that, because of the fact that the man had the ability to take on a wife. He can he can actually delegate decisions. That is why he won't leave the heir and heir be a son. Because the son is the one that, that has the name taken on, not the wife. I mean, in this day and age, people do stuff different. I've seen couples do that in real life where the husband take on the, on the last name of the wife. I'm not joking. I'm not making this up. Or the wife refused to take on her on a married name at all, not even hyphenated. But let's go on. Verse four says, then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, this man, Eleazar, will not be your heir, but he who shall come from out of your own body should be your heir. Verse five, and the Lord brought Abram outside his tent. And said, look now towards the heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, so numerous shall be your descendants be. And Abraham, verse 6, this is very important here. Then Abraham believed in, affirmed, trusted in, relied on, remained steadfast to the Lord. And he counted, when it says he in caps, it means God counted, credited, credited it to him as righteousness, doing right in regard to God and man. Let's look in verse six in the King James. It says, and he believed in the Lord and it counted to him for righteousness. This is what it says about Abraham. He believed what God said. And God says, I tell you what, it'll be counted to you as what righteousness. That song to my, I'm a friend of God by Israel Hoyt and in, in the new read, that's where it comes from. I'm a friend of God. Anybody he calls me friend. Or a friend we have in Jesus. This is where it comes from. 
God and man had a conversation here. This is before there ever was the manifestation of Yeshua on the earth. God and man had a conversation. So people try to act like God is so mystic and you can't keep it real with him. This is a real life conversation right here. God, I had no child. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my heir, who is the most responsible person as a servant, become the heir once I leave this earth. And God said, not so. I got something before. You're going to have to come from your own loins. That will be of the lineage that, that you have. And there's a reason for this. The promise that God gave Abram was not just having Isaac. It was going to have Yeshua Messiah. Jesus Christ is going to come from the bloodline of Abraham. And if you read in the first yes. chapter of, the, of St. Matthew, it says, Jesus, son of, of um, Abraham, son of David. It says that word for word. I'm not making it up. It was saying there that he was the son of Abraham, the son of David. Because it was promised to Abraham who? The promise of God was going to come through him, which was going to be Jesus Christ. You follow the lineage in the Old Testament. It was showed that that from, from um, Adam to Moses, then you have from Moses unto Jesus. And then there you have David. You have Abraham. You have the, you have the lineage of, who, of the children of Israel that Jesus came through. And it said in New Testament how Abraham actually rejoiced when he was born, when Jesus was born on the earth. He rejoiced because of the fact that he knew the promise of God came into existence. And when and when people knew when the Pharisees challenged Jesus, when he said, Abraham rejoiced at my birth, they said, How would you know that? You're not even 50. You ain't what that meant was you weren't even old enough to be around to know what Abraham did or did not do. He said, Yes, I do. I am, as in I am that I am. <laughs> as in I am that I am that led Moses and the children of Israel out of Egypt. That that I am and that I am. <laughs> I was there when it happened. I, I was the one that had the conversation with him. So that's how I know he rejoiced. So let's let that stick out for a minute. This study ain't meant to be rushed. And we will take our time to slow walk through the scriptures as we need to. Understand very carefully here. God himself is no different today as he was then. So if God gives you a promise and he tells you to do something, you believe it. Yes. And you start to take action on it. Therefore, God counts you as what? A friend. And he counts as what? Righteousness. Because guess what you're doing? You're doing his will. So if I believe you and do your will, how am I doing wrong? Mm -hmm. You count it as righteousness because here's the thing about beliefs. We do live out our beliefs. Now, the conditions for those beliefs might be different, but when the conditions present themselves, we are going to live out our beliefs, all of us, myself included. The word belief is a moon, a moon in the Hebrew. I'm trying to pronounce it as, as best as I can. Amuna is the same, has the same root meaning in it for faith and belief. Same root word, which comes from the, the E-N, Un. And Amuna actually touches on the root of faith and belief because belief is what you accept as is, absolute truth. There is no waver in it. A state a, a, a faith or having faith or but or the actual use of faith really means belief in action because of the fact that you start to act out the belief that is faith you have no proof that the belief is it, it has anything to back up it being the truth you accepted it as the truth and therefore i start to make decisions and i behave in a way that i believe the truth so to check this out what happens with Abram once he hears the promise of God? Let's look at what happens here. It says that in verse seven, I'm reading over here in the Amplified, it says, and he said to him, this is God speaking to him, uh, Abram, uh, Abram and the same Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans, 
to give you this land as inheritance. Verse eight. But Abram said, Lord, God, by what proof will I know that I inherited it? Verse nine. So God said to him, bring me a three road heifer. That's a cow. Those may not know what that is. A three road female goat. A three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, a young pigeon. See, every before there was commandments, before there was the 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 who known as the Hebrews. Abram existed before all that ever existed. He was what we we'll call an Iraqi. He was from the area today that is occupied, known as northern um, Iraq. So he basically was an Iraqi. Now, back then, they called him a Chaldean, but the Chaldeans were a group of people who had mastery over math, science, sorcery, witchcraft. The history of Abram is, is, um, is interesting, but one, one of the sources of research showed that Abram came from a family of people who made idol gods. They sculpted. And these men and women were very gifted with, with things dealing with, with magic and sorcery. Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel used to say, call the sorcerers, the astrologers, and the and the, uh, and the Chaldeans. And the reason why, because the Chaldeans had mastery over all those things. We also know the Chaldeans as being people who, who were actually in antiquity as the Magi. The Magi were, were very much from the same group as the Chaldeans. They had mastery over reading the stars or reading things in the universe. They were spiritually aware. They were able to do math, science. They knew of medicine. Mag actually Merlin, the magician from King Arthur, who was actually a real king in real life, but the, even the fairy tale version of, of King Arthur, Merlin, the, the magician, Merlin himself was of the Magi. It's called him the mage in, in, some, in some translations of, of other languages, M-A-G-E. That was a saying of people who actually followed the northern star to meet who Yeshua when he was in Egypt in the New Testament. So this this is where this man comes from. So make a long story short. This is this is his lineage. He is not a Hebrew. He is not circumcised as as we know as of yet. He is not someone who's who practices commandments because there was no commandments written by the hand of God just yet in stone. God was making a nation inside of one man. So God, so Yahweh himself told him what to get to actually prove this. And so it says here that um, he must get these, these items of the, of the heifer, the female goat, the old, uh, uh, you know, a ram, turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Those are 11 items. The number of 11 in the Hebrew represents evaluation. You might say, well, what about number nine? Yes, number nine represents uh, testing and evaluation, but the number nine comes after number eight. No pun intended. In the Hebrew, with the number, num number eight means new beginning. Number nine is the period where God begins to watch or evaluate how your new beginning is going. Number 10 is the governmental um, blessing of God, or some people call it a double portion favor because of the fact that you have five and five representing the truth because of the first five books of the Torah or the Tanakh. And then you have the double portion of that because five plus five is 10. So after 11, you have another period of testing or evaluating or of considering a matter, meaning that now that I have come and established my judgment, I'm going to consider how things are going after you have been evaluated of your new beginning. So in other words, after you have made a new beginning with your life, a new beginning of understanding, and you come into the uh, into the into the understanding, demonstrating your new beginning. Now I'm going to evaluate on after my authority has been established. In other words, because if you go through the cycles of the Hebrew calendar, you come to the eighth month, the eighth moon, if, if you will. That is where you're supposed to show the growth in your walk with God. Because after the seventh month, which is the completion month spiritually. 
you have been completed spiritually by going through God's leading and guiding according to the Hebrew calendar. But you come around that same place a year later, you should have a, a higher level of operating, if you will. Meaning that an example of like grade school, 12th grade, all the way down to the to kindergarten. To, to, you know, technically speaking, when the students start school, they go back the same time every year because every year in the 12th grade, excuse me, in the K through 12th system, a student is supposed to start a new beginning, what a new level, a new grade of what learning. Because they went through the first level of learning, which would be kindergarten. So they should have completed that within a certain period of time. So that same time in the fall of the, in, in America for the school year, you should be going back in the first grade. You come in the same time the year after that, second grade, because each grade you should have mastered and moved on. But if you don't, you go through the period of actually taking classes in the summer to get caught up to make it to that next grade. Life is no different. If we keep going around in circles, it, it is because we may have been taught some bad teaching. Everything ain't because it's your fault per se, because you did something wrong. It might be your fault because you choose to make use of outdated teaching that is not based on how God is moving. God don't stay stagnant. God moves. He's ever moving. He is ever expanding his will throughout the universe. What I mean by his will, I mean that he will lead and guide people who are his willing to do things he lead them to do. So that means that his that, that his will is unfolding in the earth for man itself. When I talk about the universe, I'm talking about how we experience it going through time and space. God is outside of time and space. He's in a mm -hmm. place called eternity yes. where things do not yes. become old. And so therefore he knows every point from start to finish because he's everywhere. He's I'm not present. Man goes from point to point. So therefore, because of that, when God expands through man himself, who was willing to obey him, things begin to change and because of that what what may have been the approach of a breakthrough in teaching in 1950 may not be the approach of breakthrough in teaching in 2022 it's based on the same word of god it's based on the same god of yahweh but the applications that man are to use to reach people ain't the same the principles are the same because the word of God is the same, but the application of it ain't the same. It's like warfare. We don't fight with swords no more. We fight not even with the guns no more. We fight war with buttons and computers now. You can push a button, you see a, a blinking light on the, on the computer screen, and you, see, and you see it change in color, and it's over with because you can send a, a missile, you can send a, a, a laser beam even from a location outside the Earth's atmosphere through satellites or through missiles underwater things change so because of that the 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 application has changed by the user but i but it ironically enough the strategies of war are the same the principles of the of, of war strategy of winning and being successful are the same because what human nature has never changed human nature is going to be what it is until god change it so therefore our applications have to change but the principles, the thing that, that gives it this foundation is universal. And that's the point I want to make here. So the point is this. You follow God and believe him. He counts as righteousness. He believed God. He didn't just say he believed God. Scripture says that he believed God, who Abraham. Well, right now he's Abraham. Let me just be clear. All right, verse 10, it says, so Abram brought all these things to him, to God, and cut them down. This is verse 10, by the way, the middle, and laid each half opposite of each other, but did not cut the birds. Verse 11, the birds of prey swooped down on the carcasses, but Abram, Abram drove them away. Verse 12. I want to make this very clear how that happened and why that happened. By him splitting open the meat of those animals, except for the birds, the files of the air, meaning like um, 
not just well crows is one of them but also the vultures that's another word for some big birds even buzzards yeah. but just do the same thing buzzards are very um cynical because they actually they come at the moment an animal starts to die even a person starts to die they can smell the change in in the in the body of the animal or the person and they wait for you to take your last breath and die before they eat you. But what they do is they stay, they hang around you. They don't even, they don't even touch you. They just know when you're near death, death is coming soon. They just wait for you to die. They just come around there and, and occupy space right around you. And as soon as you die, they eat you. But those animals being split open like that, let him know that just as the animals, we, uh, just as the vultures and fowls of the air would come down and eat the bl bloody animals that are dead, that's just as guaranteed as how God's word is about what he promised him. <clears throat> that's how clear God was making it to him. Verse 12, when the sun was setting, a deep sleep came over Abram and a horror, terror, sh shuddering, fear, nightmare of great darkness came, uh, came, overcame him. Verse 13, God said to him, Abram, know for sure that your descendants will be strangers. Let me temporarily in the land of Egypt. This is not theirs. They will be enslaved and oppressed for four hundred years check this out god tells you how it's gonna go down this is how you know that he became a friend of god god divulged to him in detail what was gonna happen this is the promise i'm giving you but this is how it's gonna happen it is gonna happen this way it's gonna it's gonna be some enslavement Ain't nobody getting off of this one. Mm -mm. But let, let's, let's look at what God says further. Verse 14. But on that nation whom your descendants will serve, I will bring judgment. And after the word, they will come out of the land out of that land with great possessions. Verse 15, as for you, you shall die and go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. Verse 16, then in the fourth generation, your descendants shall return here to Canaan, the land promised. For the wickedness and the guilt of the Amorites is not yet complete, not yet that finished. Verse 17, when the sun has gone down and a deep darkness has come, there, there appeared a smoking uh, brazier and a flaming torch which passed between the divided pieces of animals. Huh. I'm explaining this once, once we do this. Day 10, on that same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, for your descendants I have given this land from the river of the land of Egypt to the great river of the Euphrates. Verse 19, land of the Kenetites and the Kenzentites and the Catmonites. Verse 20, and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Ram and, um, and the Raphaim and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Gergeshites and the Jezebites. These are all inhabitants of that area in the Middle East around the Iraq and Iran because I because Iraq because Iraq and Iran are connected. All right. They're not the same culture. They're two different cultures. They do not get along. But they are placed there in the north middle north central area of the Middle East over in there. And as a result 
there in that, in that area. And that, that whole little region was the region in which God was promising him. Because Lebanon, excuse me, Canaan today is not what it was in the time of um, Abraham. And what God did, he walked through the pieces that he had cut. That sacrifice. And he said, uh, and it said a smoking brazier and the flaming torch came through. The smoke representing God's presence. The, the flame came through. And when it does, it, it burns or it purified the meat. Because from there on, anytime someone did a sacrifice, they had to take the meat and they do what they burned it. They put fire to it. So God's spirit came down and put fire to the meat and he sealed the covenant. If you notice, the covenant is made in what? With blood. Mm -hmm. When we say blood covenant, that means blood has to be shed. So when so when people do blood covenants or blood sacrifices, someone is being killed or blood is being shed some kind of way. And so when anyone dies, blood is shed. So if I want to make an environment very demonic, what do I do? I kill people. I have murder sprees. I have people go into these, these mad fits and rages and, and have a lot of slaughtering of deaths. So anytime you hear in the news, when people get into these situations, you hear an area or region having all these murders and killings, yeah. it's demonically orchestrated because each of those slains is a blood sacrifice. And those who might be in certain um, gang activity and, and, and there's certain um, gangs even, even in America, where you have people put a teardrop in their face for each one of their friends who has who's died. That's an ancient practice, goes back to Babylon, even the days of Abraham, where a blood sacrifice would count as a teardrop. So there's nothing brand new about these practices and whatnot. But I'm just going to just say, be aware, when you hear the news about all these shootings and slaughters and hit numbers said, there's a reason for all of that. But a death represents a blood sacrifice. Because mm -hmm. covenants are made in what blood. We used to call ourselves blood brothers or blood sisters, especially in the 70s. You have kids who will prick their thumb and mix the blood together. That was a blood covenant. Because in ancient times, like in Rome and Greece, even in parts of Africa, even if people just would slice their, their hand open on their wrist and they would mingle the blood together and then walk through a field. And they walk between rocks or they walk between sticks laid out because they walk in to make a covenant. That means they touch in the green when they do that. So this is this is how the stuff goes now. I'm not here to get into no um no theories or conspiracies. I'm just here telling you history and things from some standpoint. So God made a covenant with Abraham, but the most important thing is that God had made it clear that he was a, that Abraham was a friend. In the sense that Abraham believed, or Abram, excuse me, that's, no, the scriptures there are scriptures that say Abraham call him Abraham, but Abram believed God. It's kind of him for righteousness. That's the key thing. Believing God equals righteousness because when you believe God, you're going to do what He say. You're going to what he tells you. Which is why Jesus said, he that believed in me should do as I did and greater works than these you have seen. He that believed in me should not perish, but have whatever lasting life. <laughs> Your source is what it is. Make it clear about beliefs because beliefs are bad, positive, negative, between. And therefore, in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7 says this it says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he in behavior, one who, man who manipulates. He says to you, Eat and drink, yet ye, his heart is not with you, but it is begrudgingly lost. Now, in the King James, it says it this way. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith to he, but his heart is not with thee. The Amplified gives more clarity about how the scripture plays out in terms of manipulative behavior, behavior 
behaviors that are inappropriate per se. Guess what? It also plays out with someone who, who wants to do the right thing. They, it also plays with someone who has the right desires. There are scriptures that talk about pastors, and it says that God gives us pastors after what? His own heart, after God's own heart, to be exact. So that means I'm, that God's going to give us pastors and leaders that have the desires that God has for us as believers. Who wants to do right and teach the word of God for you to do right and live right. Not someone who wants to manipulate you or take advantage of you. And many of us have been done that way, myself included. So God himself gives people that are pastors after his own heart. And every pastor is not son of God. It, it, we have laws in this country to where if you, you can go to seminary, you can get a, a minister's license, you can set up a church, you can get ordained, and people can pay for ordination. Or getting ordained this day and age is not hard. If you find if you find somebody who will take your money and ordain you, or if you go to a school and, and that school has a thing when it automatically says, hey, we're going to do the Bible college thing here. We teach you the, the word of God. When you graduate, you'll be ordained automatically on graduation. You get ordained. So some, just because someone's ordained has a title of pastor does not mean that God gave that pastor to that ministry that that pastor is over. And by the way, you can be male or female to be a pastor. I'm not one of those people that say you cannot pastor a church if you're a woman. No, no. God called you. He called you in the story. But the heart, which is the subconscious mind, subconscious mind is where we have all our beliefs and programs at. All our beliefs and thoughts and ideas exist in our subconscious mind, which is happens as people have called back in the day, the formative years. And the reason they call it the formative years is because those are the years you take on your beliefs. A lot of stuff we learn how to do and be happened from the age of zero, from the time it was conceived in the womb, up until what about what, seven, eight, nine years old? And that's a proven fact, even by like research from Cambridge over in England. And even places like Harvard, Yale, or Stanford, they all done research to show that by the time a child is between the ages of seven to nine, 96% of who they are is already formed. Meaning that the beliefs that's going to dictate their life until they drop dead, unless they change the way they believe, is already determined by what? Their environment. If you grew up in a house where everything was always hard to get, Everybody was on Section 8. Guess what? You're going to probably find it either that you're on Section 8 or you may not be on it, but you're going to find it's financially hard to get ahead and get things done. Because usually systemic poverty is the way it is because it's been taught from one generation to the next. I, I, I knew one time a woman I used to work with. She was a retiree from the state of Michigan. From the, from the food stamp program. And she told me that she took an early retirement from the state of Michigan because she got tired of seeing what she saw as far as behaviors. And what she saw was this reoccurrence of women bringing down their 18-year-old child to the food stamp office. They get them signed up for food stamps. Even in their graduation cap and gown, the family literally went and saw the child graduate. The woman, usually it was a young lady. And as soon as she got her, dipl her diploma and went to the graduation, the family is down there as a family at the food stamp office getting her signed for food stamps. Not to go to the military to be all she can be in the Army. Not to sell the seven seas in the Navy. Or aim, or aim high for the Air Force, or to be the few and the proud in the Marine Corps, or to go to uh, things like, I know I'm kind of dating myself now, MoTeC, or even um, some type of, some people know what that is, or even the Mott Institute of Technology to learn a skilled trade, mm -hmm. or to go take some classes at a community college, or to go to a four-year university, if you notice what I'm saying, I'm saying all these options that would point to someone learning the skill. It doesn't matter if you, if you, you couldn't go to a four year school. You could have went to a trade school. You could have went to the military. You could have went and learned how to do hair and nails. You could have went and did a number of things and learned a skill to be productive member of society. But your family, not you, take you 
up there to get the food stamps. And woman told me, and she said, I kept seeing it. And the longer I worked for the state, the more I kept seeing it. It got, it used to be where women came in, if they went through a bad divorce, or if they was living with a, with a relative, they were taking care of and got sick, and they fell on hard times. She said, now people come in expecting the state of Michigan to take care of them. And you know what? I've heard the same story from other people in other, other states. It's the same game, a different name. It's not no different. There is nothing new to the behavior that the lady told me when I heard about the same thing in other states. That is a conditioning of the mind. That is a certain belief. And that belief says that someone's take care of me. Someone is due for me because I believe it. So because I believe it, what do I do? I act on it by what faith. So even if you took that person and took them around the 10 different job interview places, they will still find a reason not to go to that job. I know it for a fact. You could take somebody and have them go to school and somebody pay for it. And they'll go to school, even get the degree. But you're going to have to meet them outside every day, probably, and make sure they go to class. Because they couldn't go to the school, but they couldn't go to class. I, I actually knew someone. I had a relative like that. Send them a link of a job placement service that I've used in the past. And they told me uh, I couldn't use it. I said, why not? Uh, the job's too far. I said, where are the jobs that you're applying for? And they never told me. They would never say where the jobs were. Because what you mean is too far? Because as soon as they told me where it was, I was going to tell them how to use the bus to get out there. So, But when your beliefs are where they are, and they tell you what you can and cannot do, even if you try to do it, you're going to find every reason to not do it because it's easy to keep doing what you're doing. But guess what? It's even easier to make excuses to why not do anything different. Because it's what you know. And a lot of times we get conditioned into this idea that if I do something new and I fail, I can't do it. Because if you hang around people that birds of feather flock together, so you hang around people that got belief issues like you, if you try to do something new, they're going to try to talk you out of it, man. Like, man, well, boy, hey, 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 man, or hey, girl, how you going to do all that? You know how to do all that? No. But now, what if you do that? And then, what, 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 how you gonna do it then? Well, tell me how you how you gonna do it. I don't know how to do it. Well, now how you gonna do it then? Well, you are gonna do it by learning. Even if you go swim and learn. I mean, all right, fine. You, you, you say you know this, and that's that stuff out of your hand. Well, tell me how you go do this then. It, no, you, you you talking about you gonna do all this? But you learning? What, what you learning then? Learning is not going to class and just listening. Learning happens when you take the information you've been given, you make use of it, and you cannot make use of what you're given. That's going to prove that evidently there's a there's a gap between what you're using and your understanding of it, or if the information is just flat out and just just wrong. And I'm I'm talking from real life right here. I've had situations where I have been getting information was told this is how it works, and I've tried it ten times in a row. And I go back to the person who was teaching me and say, "Hey, you said A, B, and C." And I've done this 10 times. And here's my proof of it. How does this work? And sometimes it was a misunderstanding of how they explained it to me, where I didn't understand it the way they explained it. Or they may have realized it was things they did not explain fully or told us at all and realized that, oh, I gave you the wrong stuff. Or it been some situations, and this has happened more. This third scenario has happened more in my life than anything else. And it's probably happened to you too and most of other people. The person doing the teaching never made use of the information themselves. So they're telling you something they either heard, read in the book, or they assumed. And then I watched them do it, and I'm like, everything you just did is the opposite of what you told me. So not only is it not what you told me, it's the opposite. So we have to consider who we learn from. And then I, then I heard later on a guy who has been very successful, who's passed away, Bob Proctor, that was made a point about learning and to the effect of how if the person that's, that's team ain't showing the skills and, and their behavior, how they doing it, then then you need to question if you need to listen to them. So if you're somebody who huffing and puffing because your clothes are three sizes too small and and you out of shape, but you're going to tell me you're going to teach, you're going to be my personal trainer at Planet Fitness. I might say you might need to join the fitness class with me, my dear brother, my dear sister. 
and let's go work out together. You can be a workout partner, not the workout instructor. The same with finance. I've met a lot of people that just do finance teaching and break through a Christian finance teaching, but you want to borrow twenty dollars from me because you got a car that that costs three times as much as your house, and you need to get get your check by Friday. But you're supposed to teach me how to be rich. We're going to stop here. The whole point is your beliefs is going to dictate your success. That's what this gets to. And it's going to dictate how you trust God and how you even believe him. Abraham believed God, kind of him in righteousness. Because God knows way more than we do about how beliefs work. But the little we do know as humans is that your beliefs is going to dictate your behavior. Because I'm going to live my life a particular way based on what? And what I believe. That being said, let's end with a word of prayer. Abba Yahweh, name is Yeshua Messiah. We love you. We're sorry. We ask you to give us, we say thank you. We ask again that you go further even to our beliefs, Father God, and heal us on every level and layer and every belief and idea that we've held on that's keeping us from receiving everything that's rightfully ours in life or receiving the things that we, we've invested our time and money into even, Father God that you will heal us on those levels and layers and re reveal every belief and idea in the present moment and bring us to the present moment filled with your truth and, and with your spirit. Excuse me, filled with the truth, because the truth is your truth, because you said you are the spirit of what? The truth. So excuse me, Father. We ask right now that you will lead us and guide us to whatever, to whatever beliefs we're ready to even handle that we can even be led and guided by your spirit to actually deal with and led and guided as and you lead and guide us to the resources, the people, the books, even if it's counseling, Father God, of what we need to, to work on, to actually receive everything that you have for us to move ahead in life itself. We, we thank you for the opportunity we had today to study the word of God and may it meets us where we are and every spirit that say that we're not good enough, we're never enough, we'll never be enough. We rebuke those spirits and may them to go under the authority of Yeshua Messiah where Yeshua was safe and to go, maybe the depths of hell that may be the dry place the scriptures describe for them to walk desolate. We ask right now that you help us understand that growing and learning is not the same as, as, as losing father God. And that failure is it, that the things not going exactly the way is nothing wrong. If we're doing our best to learn something, we'd be willing to redo it and let it get any clarity, Father God, and that we are all that you say we are, and that only trust in you and, and following you. Oh, we're going to get there because we don't know the path. You do. So we, we ask that you would have us to trust you regardless of what we do and don't know. But but knowing that you are the same the eight today, yesterday, for more, and you have the desire to have every good thing that you have for us to be accepted by us. Because it had, because you have it just for us. And what you have, no man can take. In the name of Yeshua Messiah, I'm in. You all be blessed. This has been the word of God. Thank you.